Hello again. So here we are for part three of chapter one of Kanzuki's Kingdom. Uh, right. Not too long this part. To begin with, it all happened much as my father had planned, except that the training took a lot longer. We soon learned that handling a 42-foot yacht was not just dinghy sailing in a bigger boat. We were tutored by a whiskered old mariner from the yacht club, Bill Parker. Barnacle Bill, we called him, but not to his face, of course. He had been twice round Cape Horn and done two single-handed Atlantic crossings. And he'd been across the channel more times than you've had hot dinners, my lad. To tell the truth, we none of us liked him much. He was a hard taskmaster. He treated me and Stella Artois with equal disdain. To him, all animals and children were just a nuisance, and on board ship nothing but a liability. So I kept out of his way as much as I could, and so did Stella Artois. To be fair to him, Barnacle Bill did know his business. By the time he had finished with us and my mother was given her certificate, we felt we could sail Peggy Sue anywhere we wanted. He had it inculcated in us a healthy respect for the sea, but at the same time we were confident we could handle just about anything the sea could hurl at us. Mind you, there were times I was scared rigid. My father and I shared our ter terror together silently. You can't pretend, I learned, with a towering green wall of sea twenty feet high bearing down on you. We went down in tr troughs so deep we never thought we could possibly climb out again. But we did, and the more we rode our terror, rode the waves, the more we felt sure of ourselves and the boat around us. My mother, though, never showed even the faintest tremor of fear. It was her and the Peggy Sue between them that saw us through our worst moments. She was seasick from time to time, and we never were, so that was something. We lived close, all of us, cheek by jowl, and I soon discovered parents were more than just parents. My father became my friend, my shipmate. We came to rely on each other, and as for my mother, the truth is, and I admit it, that I didn't know she had it in her. I had always known she was gritty, that she'd always keep on at a thing until she'd done it, but she worked night and day over her books and charts until she had mastered everything. She never stopped. True, she could be a hit, bit of a tyrant if we didn't keep the boat shipshape, but neither my father nor I minded that much, though we pretended to. She was a skipper. She was going to take us round the world and back again. We had absolute confidence in her. We were proud of her. She was just brilliant. And I have to say the ship's boy and the first mate were pretty brilliant too on the winches. At the helm and dab hands, at the baked beans in the galley, we were a great team. So on September the 10th, 1987, I know the date because I have the ship's log in front of me as I write. We, with every nook and cranny loaded with stores and provisions, we were at last ready to set sail on our great adventure, our great odyssey. Graham was there to wave us off tearfully. In the end, she even wanted to come with us to Australia. She'd always wanted to see koalas in the wild. There were lots of our friends there too, including Barnacle Bill. Eddie Dodds came along with his father. He threw me a football as we cast off. Lucky mascot, he shouted. When I looked down at it later, I'd saw he'd signed his name all over it like a World Cup star. Stella Artois barked her farewells at them, and at every boat we passed in the Solon. But as we were sailing out past the Isle of Wight, she felt strangely quiet. Maybe she sensed, as we did, that there was no turning back now. This was not a dream. We were off around the world. It was real, really real. End of chapter one. So it ends. Here is a picture of the Peggy Sue. See that? Uh, there's the start of chapter two. So, hope you enjoyed that. It's quite a gripping story, I think. I'm looking find, forward to finding out what happens on the huge adventure. See you soon.